So you may not realize we actually plan these series out months in advance, and then you have no idea what you're going to be walking into on a Sunday morning. And so if you are like me, the events that happened at the rally last night left me swirling a little bit. And uh, for some people in our country and in our world, their only hope of transforming a nation is to resort to violence. And so as Jesus followers, regardless of the political party that you are a part of, and regardless of your personal feelings about the former President Trump, it probably has left you, it should leave us stirred and uncomfortable. And the truth is it leaves many people angry or anxious about the state of our world. And so maybe the question you're asking is like, what's our response? What should we do? And I think the first thing that we should do is pray. Prayer is our first response, not our last resort. But I also, coming in today, believe that God meant for this series to be here now, and the content of what we started last week and we're going to continue this week matters because I think it's our time. I think God has put us here for such a time as this to live out what we're talking about. And so I'm excited about what God has, but I would invite you to pray and open your heart to him and to pray for our nation, especially those impacted. Will you do that right now with me? God, thank you that we can come to you even in the midst of uncertainty and unrest. And God, we can rest in the truth that even though we're fighting battles, you've already won. And so God, today we pray for those impacted by this event at the rally in Pennsylvania, especially the family that lost a loved one, those in critical condition. God, we pray for our nation that there would be an undeniable transformation of the gospel here. And so God, fill our hearts. Use your words to spark in our heart the steps, the daily response you're inviting us into here and now. And God, use me in any way that you can in the time that we have together to speak. We are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Whatever campus you're at, those of you watching online or on TV, if you're one of the men tuning in from Toledo Correctional, from TOCI, it is a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you. And so those of you physically here, we just put your hands together to welcome our online friends, the men at TOCI. A couple years ago, my wife Lauren and I were taking a short trip for our anniversary to Boston uh, to see the sights and sounds of the city. We'd never been there before. And while we were there, we thought it'd be kind of fun to catch a Red Sox game. And sure enough, they were at home. And so, I mean, how often do you get to watch or play, see baseball in the oldest major league ballpark, Fenway Field, right? So we get to the ticket office and uh, I get up to the window and I tell the guy, give us the best seats that we have. And in his best Boston accent, he, you know, like how much you want to pay. I'm not really sure if that's Minnesotan or Boston. Um, but uh, either way, he put us with the budget that I gave him in the outfield right down the first baseline. And it was a great view. My wife and I, beautiful weather. We're just excited to be in the ballpark. But what we noticed when we got to our seats was this sea of blue next to us. Apparently, the Red Sox were playing the New York Mets. And when we sat down, I'm looking at all these Mets fans. And I'm thinking, I, I mean, I, I don't, maybe I forgot my geography, but how, like, how far away is it? Like, do these people come down here all that often? And the guy next to me was like, oh, no, they, they filled up like three busloads, four busloads, six busloads of Mets fans. And I'm telling you, these were a party bus because these Mets fans were rowdy, okay? They came and they were well lubricated for whatever it was that was going to happen that night because they're heckling the entire stadium. They're all in blue and they're like, let's go Mets, let's go Mets. And the entire stadium shouts back, let's go Red Sox. And so I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, this is amazing, okay. <laughs> they're not even paying attention to the game. The game has already started. They're just heckling each other back and forth. It was amazing. And then one Mets fan shouts out, Yankees suck. And within seconds, 
the entire stadium is shouting in unison, Yankees suck, Yankees suck, Yankees suck. And being an Indians guardian, I'm a Guardians fan, I completely agree. So I stand up and I'm joining in. I'm like, this is unbelievable. While my wife sits there cross-armed because she's a Yankees fan. Like, it's true, Lauren, <laughs> come on, let us sit in, you know? Now, I know for some of you, I just said a bad word, and if that's the case, I'm not endorsing, I'm just repeating what they, what I, what, what they said, okay? <laughs> and honestly, when you think about it, for a New Yorker, it could have been so much worse, okay? I mean, this was like rated G, but think about it, think about it. One man in a stadium of people, one man's influence turned heckling into harmony, now, today, my hope is to help you realize that you have that same kind of potential. And if we're going to see God transform a nation, it will begin as more Jesus followers start to believe this truth, that your influence has more potential than you realize. Now, we talk about this all the time. We say things like, you are not an accident to God. You are not a mistake. Like God has put you on earth, on purpose, for a purpose. God has a part for you to play. But where all of that begins is by realizing this truth. It's by believing it that your influence has potential. And maybe you're like, well, what do you mean by influence? I mean like social media influence or no? I mean the capacity to impact someone else's life, someone else's life. For some of you, it may be a bigger crowd, but we all have that kind of capacity. And either you're using that influence, you're aware of that influence, or you're ignoring it. You're not paying attention to it at all. You're not stewarding it. And for those of you that are aware of your influence, you can use it for you, you can use it for other people, for other products, for other missions. But when you start to understand your God-given influence, you realize the incredible eternal potential that you could make, the impact that you could make in someone's life. See, the challenge when we think about the word influence, when we hear stuff like this, is we tend to think of the big results and we overlook the small starts where our influence can sometimes have a bigger impact than we could ever realize. And so if we're gonna see God transform our family, our schools, our community, our friends' lives, our nation, it will begin as more of us start to believe that this is true. And last weekend, we kicked off a series called Transforming a Nation, where we're talking about this first century letter written by Paul to Titus, who is overseeing churches on the island of Crete, which is an island off of mainland Greece. And we're not, don't think buildings like church buildings, think gatherings of Jesus followers in living rooms. So Titus would travel around this fairly large island, helping lead and oversee this movement of people who've been transformed by the gospel. The tension is the Cretan culture is notorious for lying. They're notorious for being lazy. They're notorious for being lustful people. Some of the influences have crept into that culture and now they're trying to make sure that they don't distort the gospel. And so last week we looked at the first two verses of this letter where in Paul's introduction, he makes it clear that Titus's mission is to teach the truth of the gospel, which is a truth that shows us how to live, not just things to think about. Why? Because your beliefs influence your behavior. What you believe is true will shape what you do, right? And this is true for your influence. If you look in the mirror and you think, man, I've got nothing to offer, it's going to shape how you behave when you show up at work, at school, with others. But when you start believing that your influence has more potential than you realize, it's going to change how you show up in almost every environment you find yourself in. Now, where Paul started is not with your influence. He started with what informs our influence, and that's the gospel, the gospel message of Jesus. And gospel means good news. You know what it doesn't mean? Good advice. And that's what a lot of people think Christianity is. It's a list of rules. It's a list of advice. It's the path that you take to connect with God. It's like every other religion. No, it's not. Christianity is not what we need to do to connect with God. 
Christianity declares that God did what was needed so that we could connect with him through his grace. That's what Jesus' work enables us to do. And he empowers us to live differently. In fact, every series that we do, you may not realize this, we pick a memory verse that kind of captures the theme of the series. And I would encourage you to memorize it because when you memorize scripture, you put it in your head and in your heart. And I believe God's spirit can bring that back for you or for others. And so here's a verse to memorize. He, Jesus, it comes from chapter two of Titus, Jesus gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make you and me his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. This is a powerful summary statement of the gospel. And where most religion gets it backwards, they start that we need to do good deeds in, evil, in order to be a part of God's people so that we might be cleansed and then freed from every sort of sin. That is not Christianity. God did what was needed. Jesus gave his body, shed his blood, came back from the dead to free you and me, to cleanse you and me from sin, to make us a part of his eternal family, which is totally committed to making a difference. In, in other words, the transforming of a nation begins with a gospel-shaped life. Culture has a whole lot of other ways, through politics, through money, through business, through school, through different initiatives to transform your culture. But Jesus followers believe that it is the gospel that is the power of God, that it's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that change us. It's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that's more than just a ticket into heaven. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to heaven when I die, so whatever we do here doesn't really matter. No, 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 if we believe that Jesus forgave sin, your sin and mine, and we're no longer held captive to our sin, shame, and guilt, it should impact how you look at yourself in the mirror. Which means anytime you look at yourself and you think, I got nothing to offer and I've just made a mess of my life, that's not the voice of God in your life. If you believe what Jesus did, it changes how we behave. If you believe that Jesus loved you and me, even though we were still sinners, even though we were far from God, he still loved us, and you follow Jesus, then his love reshapes how you love the world around you. It changes your behavior. If you believe that Jesus defeated sin and death, the power of sin and death through his resurrection, then you have hope each and every day that who you were is not shaping who you will become, that where you are is not your forever. Like you have a future and a hope. The best is yet to come. That's what Paul is talking about right in the introduction. And so he gets practical in, in verse five, right? He says, your influence matters. So I left you on the island of Crete so that you could complete our work there. Like you have work to do, Titus. If we're gonna see the transforming of a nation, you need to appoint elders in each town as I instruct you. Now, I hope you're reading along with us on the Titus reading plan, because if so, you've been reading this chapter all week. And our hope is that you read it slowly because sometimes if you're like me, you kind of skim through and it's like the second time through, I pick up on things that I missed the first time. I'm, I'm hopeful that today I'll help you do that a little bit. But Paul, in this opening kind of directive, he's telling Titus, if we're gonna share the gospel, if we're gonna see the gospel spread, the work that you need to do is to appoint elders. Now, whether you grew up in church or not, I'm not sure your background or your experience with that word elders. And without getting into all of the ways that this word has been debated and become divisive within churches, in the original language, that word means a leader or an overseer. And so what Paul is saying is if we are gonna see the truth of the gospel spread, we need to appoint leaders. Now think about that. Of all the things he could have said, we need to make sure everybody's reading their Bible. That's important. I mean, the challenge is most of the people they were reaching were illiterate and they didn't have paper copies of the Bible. How fortunate we are today, right? I mean, that's valuable, but he didn't say that. He didn't say you need to have a really great worship service with a killer band, as great as that is. That's not what's gonna lead to the transforming of a nation. No, he started here, appoint leaders. Why? Because influence matters. If we are gonna complete the work that God has for us, for our community, we have to see that we have influence and our influence has more potential than we realize. And we need to help other people see that their influence has potential as well. Speed of the leader, speed of the team. Have you heard that before? Essentially, that's what it's saying. As the leaders begin to understand this, more people will follow. That same principle is true today. The problem 
is that most of us, we don't believe it or we don't see it. We look at our life and we're like, oh, I can't really influence anything. I don't know what difference I'm going to make. I, that's for other people. We overlook the opportunities that we have to leverage our influence. So I want to help you see it. I want you to think about the people in your life. And if you need help, think about your family. Think about the school that maybe you attend or maybe the work where you go to work or your neighbors or your friends, like who you hang out with. And if you are watching online in some remote village where you work online and you don't really talk to anybody, don't have any neighbors and don't think you have any friends, maybe you need to look at where you go shopping. Oh, I shop online. Do you have any hobbies? Where you, do you hang out? Where do you have coffee? Where do you work out? Or like I like to put in my notes, work outs more than once. You know, it's like multiple gyms. I don't know. But it's like, okay, we're, here's the thing. I, I'm guessing most of us overlook that. Oh, we got to go to school. I hate school. Oh, I hate my job. The people there drive me crazy. It's like, if you miss the influence that God has for you there, then we end up surrendering an incredible amount of territory to the enemy of God. In fact, I'm convinced that the most devastating work Satan does is he distracts you from this potential. I mean, Jesus warned us there is a thief, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us a rich, abundant, purposeful life. And people complain, like, where's the purpose? I have to go to work. No, that is the purpose. See, the thief wants to steal your vision and kill your purpose and destroy your potential. And friends... Today, it's time to fight back. Remember, your beliefs shape your behavior. So if you believe that you're not an accident, that God put you on earth on purpose, that means each place you find yourself is an opportunity with God to influence others. Because with God, your influence has eternal potential. And I want you to see it. That leads to another question. Well, like, Ben, what am I supposed to do? Like, am I supposed to show up at work and preach or like do a Bible study? You know, Paul instructs Titus on what to look for with the leaders that he's supposed to appoint. And the first place he tells Titus to look is leaders or people who lead well at home. Why? Because influence starts at home. It starts at home. I'm not talking about physical home. I'm talking about the people that you're closest to, the people who see the real you. Because what we don't need is a bunch of pretenders out there telling everybody I got my life together and their life is a mess. We don't need more social media influencers who have this huge following, but their internal world is a mess. No, we need people, we need leaders that the closer you get to them, the more you respect them. Like you're like, oh, wow, like that's my goal. I know I don't get to meet every person, but my goal is the closer you get to me, the more you get to know me, you're like, oh yeah, like who I see on the stage is who he really is. Like, man, he's not just making it up. And I know I don't always get it right. That's part of it. It's being honest with your life and your struggles. I mean, this is exactly where Paul instructs Titus to look for influencers. Look at what he says in verse six. An elder, a leader must live a blameless life. They must be faithful to, he must be faithful to his wife or their spouse. Their children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a member of God's household. And so they must live a blameless life, blameless, twice, faithful in marriage. Children who are not wild and rebellious, which has some of your parents like, well, that discludes me. <laughs> Just so that we're clear, he's not talking about adult children, Okay. And the truth is, in that culture, you are no longer kids once your body was capable of having children. So like 12, 13, 14, you're basically into adulthood, starting your own life. And so the goal is really to manage your kids in those little years well. Why? Because if you can manage, if you can influence your home, it's, it starts here, right? That, that's what's important. And some of you at this point are like, but Ben, I don't want to be a church leader. Like he's talking about church leaders, like pastors, I just work at Jeep. Like, I'm just a teacher. No, time out. They didn't have paid pastors like we do today. They didn't have organizational structure like our society is used to today. 
Our society is different. They had everyday, ordinary people who were stepping into leadership. In fact, Paul says to an, in another letter that he wrote to a guy like Titus named Timothy, he says, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he or she desires an honorable position. In some translations, it says, it's admirable if you pursue these qualities. It's beneficial. Like In some ways, we should all aspire to do this. And so if you want to understand and step into your influence that has more potential than you realize, it starts with those who are closest to you. And so are you living a blameless life at home with those who know you? Now, that doesn't mean perfect. Blameless is not perfect. Blameless means you're honest which when you screw up, you own it. Like, man, I didn't get that right. Blameless means you don't allow ongoing patterns of destructive behavior to disrupt you or the people around you. Are you living blameless? Are you living above reproach? And are you managing your responsibilities? Like parents, you really are the pastor of your kids. You're the spiritual leaders of your family. Are you stepping into that? And I know it's intimidating and it's hard. And if you didn't have that, we love to partner with you. We have tons of resources to help you in that role. For those of you that are teenagers or kids that are sitting in the auditorium or watching, are you respecting your parents? Are you stepping into that responsibility well? Because that's what it looks like to start at home. If you're wondering what it looks like practically, Paul says, don't be, an ar- don't be arrogant or quick-tempered. You must not be a heavy drinker or dishonest with money. Rather, you must enjoy having guests in your home. You must love what is good. You must live wisely and be just. You must live a devout and disciplined life. For some of you, you're like, well, this is starting to sound a little (laughs) rulesy. Like, isn't this the to-do list that we say? You know, like, this. I'm confused here, right? But think about this, okay? I want you to think about the people that you like to hang out with. Think about life-giving friends, people that inspire you. If you started to write down some of their characteristics, it would probably look a little bit like this. Like, is it life-giving to hang out with arrogant people? And people who fly off the handle at a moment's notice and people who are drunk or violent or dishonest with money? I mean, don't we want friends that are hospitable and love what is good and are wise? Like, isn't this the type of person that we are attracted to? Like, these are the characteristics that lead to natural influence with people. It starts within. It starts with you, within me. This is called self-leadership. Why? Because leading self is the foundation of all influence. See, we think it's about all of the brilliance and the talent and the charisma and the strategy. Those things are helpful. But the people who have the most significant impact whether we know their name or not, started with leading themselves well. Like there's so many people who want to do something amazing, but they don't start here. And that's what Paul's saying. It starts with character. And so Paul lists what to look for and what to avoid. And if you're like me, confession, sometimes I read lists like this in the Bible in a reading plan and I start scanning through and I'm like, well, if I were to grade myself, there are 11 items there. I got probably eight out of 11 that I feel like I'm doing okay. And the three, I, you know, I got some work to do, not bad, and you move on. And so this time around, I was like, okay, God, what if instead when we read, it's like, God, where are you inviting me to grow? Because sometimes I read and I'm like, you know who needs to read this? <laughs> I should send them this passage. They really need, you know, it's like, no, no. So let's review the list. Paul says, don't be arrogant. Do you know what it means in the original language? That word is to be self-willed. It's to please yourself first. It's to think about what you need, what you want, and put that above everybody else. I didn't even get past the first word. And I'm like, ah, Do I think I'm arrogant all the time? No. But if I don't pause and think about this one space, like, God, where do I have some room to grow? Do do I have some apologies to make? Because you you don't have to look very long to find pastors of churches who allow this to completely destroy their influence. It's like, where where are you at, Ben? Like, are you aware? Don't, Don't let that ruin your potential. What about you? 
mean, it's so natural for us to think about ourselves first, to be self-willed. Man, I, I don't want that to hijack my influence or yours. The next one is quick-tempered, easily angered. If, I, if, if we were to go back a week and you were to put me invisibly in your car while you were driving around, what would I see? I mean, for, for some of you, if you're like my daughter Lydia, you're a pleasant driver. But my kids sometimes see me get a little mouthy with a person in front of me. Like, what are you doing? You know, it's like, Dad, it's okay. You know, like, are you quick-tempered in the car, at work, with your kids? Like, this isn't God, like, coming down on you. It's an opportunity for you and I to see what are the things that are limiting our potential. Are you a heavy drinker? I mean, we all are going to have to come to terms with the role that alcohol plays in our life, if it has a role at all. The Bible never says that alcohol itself is bad, but it does say don't get drunk. And the National Institute for Alcohol Abuse says four to five drinks, four for women, five for men, a day is heavy drinking, or eight to 15 drinks per week. See, sometimes we just allow ourselves to get into patterns of behavior and we think, well, I'm in control. Like, I'm, I don't think I'm drunk, but we're, we're not actually asking, is this helping my influence? Is this helping me grow into the person that God created me to be? Are you violent? It's like we look at people that are like serial killers, like, well, I'm not that. But it, what it's talking about here is it's always ready to blow. Like you're, ju you're just on the edge. Somebody says the one wrong thing. It's like, let's, let's go. Ready to fight, verbally, physically, whatever. That'll hijack your influence. Dishonest with money really is about greed. It's taking advantage of every opportunity to get more for you. Like do a little inventory. Where are you at with this? Not as a way of feeling bad about yourself. God's like, I don't want that to limit your potential because your influence has more potential than you realize. And so today's a nudge, a spiritual nudge to maybe course correct in a way that could totally hijack your potential. And instead of doing these things, rather, he says, enjoy having guests in your home. That's ho simple hospitality. Pay attention to the needs of the people that you interact with and be ready to meet them. Not literally guests in your home, that is part of it, but it's just be a hospitable person at work. Say thanks to the people who are working. Be courteous when you're out in public. Be hospitable. Love what is good. Be a promoter of virtue. Live wisely. Have a sound mind. Be just. That means take responsibility for what's yours. Be honorable in your interactions with people. Devout. Pure motives, not selfish motives. Disciplined. Having power over your own inclinations. Strong belief. Be willing to stand up for your personal faith and your convictions when appropriate. Like, this is where influence starts. And so where is God inviting you to maybe take a step today? Not because he's disappointed, not because you're a failure, but because your influence has more potential than you realize. Like, how you show up, it matters. And it's easy to wait on everybody else to change. It's easy to think about what other people need to do to make our world better today. But the transforming power of the gospel in the first century church was individuals living this out in spite of emperors that were killing them, people that were imprisoning them, cultural people that were lying to them. They had it so far more challenging than we've ever known, and yet God used those people to change an empire. That kind of influence is powerful. So we overlook these small starts and mistakenly believe we need to pursue the things that lead to big results. So I'm hoping to change that today. I'm hoping to help you see your influence has incredible potential with God. One of the ways that I grow in my own self-leadership, every year I attend the Global Leadership Summit and I attend this event with a prayer, God, what is it in me that needs to change as a leader and as an individual? It is designed for leaders who follow Jesus and it's to help, it will help all of you with your own self-leadership. It'll poke around in some areas where you're either insecure or need to grow and it does for me every year, but it also offers fresh actionable insight on how you can influence others at home and at school in the workplace. It is one of the most valuable investments I make in my leadership and the leadership of our team. In fact, I pay for our kids to go 
My 15-year-old son, Sam, will be attending, I think, his third leadership summit, and it's fun to sit down next to him and have him take notes, and we talk about it a little bit after. He doesn't love every speaker, but man, he's taking away some keen insights at a young age. I would encourage high school students, college students to attend. We have a, something called GLS Next that may be a fun fee, uh, uh, aspect of this designed for you. You can talk to your student ministry director about it. The conference is also designed as a way to introduce your unchurched marketplace coworkers to Jesus. And so if you're a business leader, you can invite your unchurched friends to come and attend with you. I mean, I love inviting my unchurched kind of business associates. It's a nationally simulcasted event. And so you have Coach K from Duke. He'll be talking about what he learned as the head coach of Duke. You also have Craig Rochelle, who is the pastor of probably the largest church in the United States and has one of the most listened to leadership podcasts of any leader in any sector. You also have the comedian Michael Jr. who will have us all laughing. We have Marcus Buckingham, the author and kind of the godfather of the strengths movement in the United States. Harvard professor and Jesus follower, Arthur C. Brooks, who's gonna talk about how to build a better life and move from strength to strength. Molly Fletcher, the female version of Jerry Maguire. She's been a, uh, the sports agent athlete for some of the top performers. She's gonna talk about how we can increase or max out our performance while staying healthy. I mean, this is incredible insights. And so this is the last weekend to get the best price. I don't want you to miss that. You could bring your leadership team. Even if you can only come for one day, I think it's worth it. And if not, I'll find a way to give you your money back. And if you're sitting here wondering like, why is Ben so fired up about this? It's because I see the potential impact that each of you can make. Like I believe God has put you in people's lives on purpose. And yes, we need to sharpen that skill. We need to steward that influence well. You might not see the instant impact. You might not see the result, but don't underestimate it. I mean, it was the invite of a girl that I don't remember her name and I don't think I've seen her since that invited me to Cedar Creek. And God used Cedar Creek to change my life. You might be the only encounter with Jesus someone else gets. Your influence has way more potential than you realize. And there is nothing that Satan would love to do more than to get you to ignore that. Paul is like, look for people who lead themselves well, who love what is good and are just and live a disciplined life and have a strong belief. When people lead themselves well, then they will be able to encourage others. Then they will be able to influence others. Self and then others, right? With wholesome teaching and show others how to, uh, who oppose what is true where, or oppose it point out where they, um, those who oppose where it, the truth, and where they are wrong. I'll get it out there eventually. <laughs> the, the issue or the truth is when we are faithful here, it will, you will have opportunity out there. When you tend to God's work in you, it naturally opens up opportunity to influence others through you. And so what does that influence look like? Encouragement and correction. Encouragement first with wholesome teaching and then help those who don't see where they are wrong, not that they are wrong. It's not our job to make other people feel small, to perpetuate shame and you're wrong and you're evil. No, no, that was never Jesus' way. Jesus gently connected before he corrected. Sure, there was times when he was clear. Some of you are thinking of verses in your head with whips and woes and all of that. I get it. There were times when he was clear, but Jesus' path was through his life and his words. And so one of the ways we do this is through Serve Day. Like next weekend, hundreds of people are gonna be showing up all across Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan to do what? To encourage our community. We don't show up in someone's backyard and be like, man, you really made a mess of this. <laughs> you screwed this up. You need our help. No, we come alongside of the community. This is what Paul is talking about. Be a positive life-giving influence. Sometimes it's just helpful to just show up caringly, open-handedly. And so think about this. When we lead self, it opens up opportunities to lead others. When we start at home, then we look for small ways to encourage the people around us at school, at work, and our family. And I'm not suggesting you show up in their life saying, God sent me to correct in you what's wrong, okay? You really need straightened out and I'm here to help. That's not influential, that's just rude. What it does mean if you're gonna influence others is just be attentive. When they're struggling, be willing to listen and pray for them. 
At, learn how to ask great questions. So influential. I mean, this is what Paul is modeling to Titus. See, Titus is influenced by Paul to then influence others. And so in some ways, we need a Paul. You need somebody who you are allowing to influence you spiritually. You need a mentor-like person in your life. Do you have that? And if not, you have a church full of people. Opportunities seated right next to you. We also need people that we are influencing. Because if we just take and consume what you're hearing from me and other preachers, you are stagnant. You are not growing unless you are pouring it out into the lives of others. Do you have other people that you are influencing? Do you have those relationships? If not, make that your prayer and your goal for the summer or the year. And when you do begin to have those kinds of relationships, when you're leading yourself and you're leading others, some of you will grow into a leader of leaders where God will multiply exponentially your impact through the investments you make in other leaders that are influencing others. This is where Paul is at. He is influencing Titus, who is a leader, who is influencing leaders, who's influencing other leaders to transform a nation. The term for this is called leadership pipeline. This is just a portion of it. In 1970, Walter Mahler at GE developed the term. What's amazing is this isn't a new phenomenon. You see this same sort of intentional leadership development in the New Testament. It started with Jesus, who gathered around him 12 average everyday dudes, and he helped them begin with self-leadership and then sent them out to influence others. And then Jesus left. He left him. It's like, it's your turn. And when he left, along came an individual named Saul at the time who later became the apostle Paul, who was influenced by those who were influenced by Jesus. And he learned self-leadership and then he was sent out. And he ran into a guy named Titus. And God used Paul to help play a role in Titus's faith. And Titus followed along Paul until he was sent out. God used that kind of movement to transform a nation. And he's still doing it today. Everyday people through local churches. The local church is the hope of the world. Why? Because the local church through God can do things that government can't, business can't, schools can't, public initiatives can't, as good as they may be. God has equipped and envisioned and empowered the local church to be the hope of the world. So it's time to stop making excuses and stop checking out and realize that your influence has more potential than you realize. And if there's a part of you right now that's got a little feeling in your chest, like Ben's pumped up today, okay? And you're starting to feel it, man, take a step. Don't let the thief steal, kill, and destroy it. Start practicing it today. Start here. And if you need a little help getting clarity around your purpose, attend growth track. It's not just a class to get you connected to the church. It's specifically designed to help you see how God has wired you and to see the broader mission and vision that God has called each of us into. See, Titus didn't start as a lead pastor. He started as Paul's traveling secretary. And he was faithful with those little assignments and God used that to grow him into a bigger one. And so what small step do you need to take today? Maybe it is the nudge to come to the summit and go, I need to get a grander vision for my life. I need to grow in my self-leadership. Sign up today. Don't wait. Another step that you could take is join us at Serve Day. We all know that serving others is important. It's just way more fun when you do it with your friends. And so next weekend, join us. Do something on your own. It doesn't have to be our own thing. I mean, we get, we're giving away free shirts to be a part of it. And we, you know, we all need another free shirt to add to our 500 that we have at home. Step into something. Make it your prayer when you go to work. God, use me. Open my eyes. Imagine what could happen if we really believed in the God-given potential of our influence. It would transform a nation. It would. And I see examples of this in you all of the time. You are the story that God is writing here. Those of you on the dream team, those of you group leaders leading and investing in the people around you, the next gen. I see it in those of you parents and grandparents investing in your kids' lives. Those of you serving kids and next steps or students, next gen up in students. I saw it at Fusion Camp this week where we had grandparents all the way down to high school students investing in middle school students, business owners, teachers, all sorts of different people taking a week off of their year to make a difference in the next gen. One of the inspiring stories for me was of Tina, 
Tina's 63 and she's serving at middle school camp. Now, if you're like, why did you give her age? Because she gave it to me, okay, Tina? So she's at our Finley campus. She serves as an interpreter for the deaf who attend our church. And someone noticed that she was si signing for the deaf community up front at Finley, and they asked if she would be willing to help out in students because a young man by the name of Bryson, who was deaf, had started attending. And so as you can imagine, if you're a middle school student and you're trying to connect at church, a lot of spoken word in conversation, it would be really hard to feel like you're connected anywhere. Most of the time, the deaf feel left out of all of the things that we take for granted. And so she agreed, she said that she would. She would sign at the weekend and then whenever she could help with Bryson at students, she would help there. And one weekend, they were giving away free tickets to Fusion Camp. And guess whose name got picked? Bryson. Jumped up in the air, so excited. And Tina said, I guess I'm going to Fusion Camp. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there for the very first session, and I had heard a little bit of this story. And the tradition at Fusion Camp is when the worship is played, all of the kids rush to the stage, and there's jumping and singing and engagement. And if you haven't seen it, it is unbelievable. And I noticed Tina off to the side. Tina is signing for the first song and she is signing like a rock star. I mean, she's into the music and the beat and feeling every moment. And I was just like, this is amazing. But what I wanted to see was Bryson. And so I made my way uh, backstage. I'll never forget it. I mean, it took me a minute to point out Bryson and I could tell because he would look up at her signing. He would look while they were talking and then he would hold the stage to feel the rhythm of the music. And then when the students started jumping, he looked around at a couple of his friends, smile ear to ear and was in it with all of the students feeling like he connected because he had someone there who understood her influence has more potential than she realized. Afterward, I heard more of Bryson's story, and it's been hard. I mean, left out, left behind, but for four days, Tina helped him connect with God and others to the point where Bryson's like, I feel it. And yes, his story is still unfolding, but her influence has impacted his life and potentially his eternity. And if you would have asked Tina like a year ago, do you see yourself at Fusion Camp? Do you want to serve at Fusion Camp? She probably would have laughed and said, no, I'm 63. It's not for me. But instead of resisting, she stepped into an opportunity to use her influence for God. So where is God inviting you to step today? Like God's plan for transforming a nation, it continues to be the local church. It's here. You are the story God wants to write here. It has been his plan A since the beginning. There is no plan B. Our time is now. And so, yes, it starts within with self-leadership, but it also starts with who? Who is your one? Who is the at least one person that God has put in your life? Who are the people and the places that God has put around you? Begin by serving them and praying for them and asking God, use me. Let's stop making excuses and let's start exploring this life-changing opportunity, this life-changing adventure to make a difference because your influence has more potential than you realize. You make that your prayer with me today. God, thank you for the gospel the good news of your grace that changes us. Thank you for doing what was needed so that we could connect with you. And so replace our anxiousness with your peace and clarify our purpose where we feel empty and unsure. And God, fill us with your boldness instead of our outrage. We are ready to be a part of your work today. And so help us see the places you put us with fresh vision. Give our eye, open our eyes to the people that you put around us. Give us the courage to leverage our influence to fight back against evil for the